So this is a clip of Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson having a discussion hosted by Dave Rubin about Christianity and Judaism, similarities and differences. I want to watch it and give you my own reflections on the conversation. So have a watch. Question that I said to you, I, there was only one thing I said to you guys before yeah, yeah. we started that I wanted to get to something about most of the lectures that you're, when we're doing these things, you're usually talking about the Old Testament. Now, obviously, you're an Old Testament guy. I'm Von But my, my question was, do you think that Ben or, or just people that believe in the Old Testament exclusively are missing something? So you just laid out a case of something that potentially is missing so there. Do you think that argue. is a I'm fair argue. argument? Well, what I'm going to argue is that what you just said is fundamentally unchristian in the sense that you're saying that everyone is supposed to imitate Jesus and the basic conceit of, from what I understand, uh, speaking with Christian theologians, is that we are fundamentally incapable of taking on our own sin and so we have to have somebody who comes in the form of Christ on earth in order to accept that suffering for us and that that is the purpose of God actually embodying himself in Christ, is to provide human beings the capacity to withdraw from original sin, that we don't actually have the capacity hmm. beyond a certain point to overcome, and that's why Jesus as a singular figure is necessary. I actually agree from a Judaic point of view with everything that you say, because for me it's about accepting the responsibility for my own sins on myself, and I don't have the ability to say that there is the, the suffering servant, the suffering Lamb of God, who sacrificed himself to relieve me of my sins mm -hmm. and therefore give me a fair shot at life. Yeah, well, uh, okay, so okay, that's a, that's a really good objection, I think. And I think that there's a fair bit of confusion about that in the Christian community, for example. So I would say that that perspective is more explicitly Protestant. And then, then I would put the Catholics next to that, but then I would put the Orthodox types fairly far away from that, which is why so many Orthodox Christians, I think, have been interested in what I'm saying, because their sense, and this is where my knowledge of Christian theology starts to run out, because mm -hmm. it's like I'm not an expert, I'm, you know, in the, in the doctrinal differences. Right. Um, their sense is that it's the imitation that's of primary importance. Now, mm -hmm. it's, it's a weird thing, because even in classical Christianity, you have, let, let's say, Protestant Christianity, you have this idea that, well, Christ died to save us all from our sins, and so we're already redeemed. But that doesn't alleviate the moral burden, weirdly mm -hmm. enough, because you'd think it should. So there's this paradox. And I think it's, I, I think part of the reason for that, uh, this, is, this is an extraordinarily complicated thing, but in, in, in the Brothers Karamazov, Christ comes back to earth. Right. And... Um, in Seville during the Spanish Inquisition and so he's doing his miracles and raising people <coughs> from the dead and like being all messianic and right. the first thing that happens is the Inquisitor arrests him, right. throws him in prison and then comes to visit him and basically says look um, the last thing we need after setting up this church for 2,000 years is you. You're a lot of trouble. You've put a moral burden on human beings that's too much for them to bear. And so what we've done is watered it down and put some intermediaries in place so that the moral demand that your example required doesn't just crush people into nothingness, right? So every ideal is a judge. Right. So then you have the ultimate ideal, that's the ultimate judge. And from the Inquisitor's point of view, that judge was too much. It was too right. demanding. And so I think there's an, and so, so anyway, so the Inquisitor goes through all this argument and says we're going to have to, keep, you know, get rid of you again because <laughs> you're, you're just too much to bear. Mm -hmm. And so Christ listens and doesn't, says any, doesn't say anything. And then just when the Inquisitor stands to leave, Christ kisses him on the lips. And the Inquisitor mm -hmm. turns white in shock and then leaves, but he leaves the door open. And that's the brilliant, uh, that's the brilliant ending of, of Dostoevsky's piece. The Grand Inquisitor, and, yeah. Yeah, and it, what makes him such a genius because he basically says something like, well, look, the, the Catholic Church did reduce the burden and it is corrupt in the way that earthly organizations are likely to be corrupt and it does allow an out which is well you can put your sins on Christ let's say and that alleviates your moral burden but it still keeps the damn door open well this and is that's, so th this is why I think it's really fascinating having having spent a lot of time with Christian theologians in the past couple of years writing this book is that the the original conceit, I think, when, when, when you talk with people who are Christian and Jewish and you have sort of interfaith conversations, uh, the original one-sentence conceit and the difference between them is that what you'll hear from Jews is Judaism is acts-based and Christianity is faith-based. Christianity is about the acceptance of Christ. When you accept Christ, then you've accepted what you need to accept and everything flows therefrom. Mm -hmm. And Judaism says it's not just about accepting 
God, it's all these mitzvot, right? There are all these commandments that you have to do, and these are what perfect you as a human being. It's, it's the performance of these commandments, accepting God's sovereignty, because he's the one who gave the commandments, but you actually have to act in the world, and if you don't mm -hmm. act in the world, then you haven't fulfilled your responsibility in the world. Th this and, could also be an argument why you could have, although I know you wouldn't be thrilled with yeah. them per se, you could have Jewish atheists in that they believe that it's just their actions here. Yes, 100%, so, yeah. so th this is why you know Jews have had very, most Christians believe this too. The idea of having a moral atheist is not really a difficult idea. Yeah. It's the idea of having a system built on atheism that's completely immoral and will fall apart almost immediately. And the idea of having a moral system built on atheism, if you examine your atheism closely enough, I think falls apart. I think that moral atheism is basically you separating your morality from your atheism and then ignoring your atheism in pursuit of the morality, which is, well, you can live fine that way, that's fine, but I don't think that that's psychologically sustainable um, in, if you actually examine the core of your ideas. But with, with that said, I think that Christianity, after its original millenarian viewpoint, when, when Christianity first came about, the idea of Christ on earth was that he had ushered in the messianic era because this was it was it was a new era it was a new day and then it turns out that people looked around and went well this looks a lot like the old day right, right, not, right. not that much has changed mm -hmm. and so what changed what changed was our spiritual status that was the new redefinition of the messianic era is that the the what christ had brought to earth was a new spirit right he he yep. brought a new spirit into the earth and he he cleansed people of their sins and given them a fresh shot at life basically yep. uh, and that in doing so he changed the nature of of how things work well, Judaism basically said, well, we never thought that that nature changed in the first place, right? That's, that's, that's something different. And so, ironically enough, I think one of the sources of Christian anti-Semitism over time is an attempt to distinguish what makes Christianity different from Judaism other than Christ. Because Christianity and Judaism, in most of their main philosophies, have an awful lot in common. It's interesting, I just interviewed um, a, uh, a fellow named John MacArthur, who's a major pastor, major Christian theologian. I interviewed him a couple of days ago for our Sunday special. And this came up, I asked him, so where do you think the differences are between Christianity and Judaism? And he basically said, Jesus, right? That's the difference. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the mostly honest answer because when I hear Christian theologians try to distinguish Judaism from Christianity, what they say about Judaism, I find to be not accurate as to what Judaism actually says, and when I hear Jews try to distinguish Christianity from Judaism, I think that, and I'm not saying they're the same thing, mm -hmm. because they're not, obviously, they're different belief systems, but in terms of the underlying value system, the reason that we say Judeo-Christian value system is because in terms of the value system itself, the commonalities are overwhelming. They're overwhelming. The differences are mostly doctrinal and historical, and in terms of what you think, God, I think that Christians read back in an Acts-based version of their own lives through a variety of mechanisms, whether they say, well, predestination exists, but in order to show that if I were really elect, I would be acting this way, right? That is an acts-based version. It's just retroactive mm -hmm. from the end. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is why if you say to a Christian, so you really believe that you can lead a terribly dissolute, awful, terrible life, but if you believe in Christ with the full fiber of your being, you're going to heaven? And they'll so, say, well, the, well, and, and many of them will say yes, but then you say, but what makes a good person? And they'll say, right, not, but if, uh, and right, what they'll exactly. always add, but if you believe in Christ, you wouldn't do all those things. Mm -hmm. Well, right? that's the, this, this is, yeah, so there's a lot to unpack here, but I'm not so sure I agree that there's a lot to unpack here, and I am not so sure there's a lot to unpack here, and when Ben said that there's not that much difference between Christianity and Judaism, I think there's one major fundamental difference which actually runs at the very core of their discussion here and that is the question of why are we actually here in the first place because you have on the christian side and you've hear this from from jordan talking it's very centered around uh you know sin we our sin is too great to bear the moral burden we're bad we need jesus to save us and we need um salvation and it's very focused on who's going to get that salvation who's going to make it to heaven and then ben he rightly points out that judaism is very acts acts action uh, focused um that is true although i don't just don't think it's true that judaism is is not interested in the faith part as well but the question is why why do you have such a difference when christianity it seems the focus is very much on getting salvation, getting to heaven, getting that salvation. 
But on the other hand, Judaism is much more focused on the our actions here. Why would that be? And it actually comes down to, it boils down to one very simple question about why we are here. See, if your narrative is as follows, that we are here because um, God created us, let's say, and he wants to give us a shot at getting to heaven out of kindness. So he puts us here and he tries to see if we can earn heaven through our moral actions and concludes that that's not going to work. So instead he sends his son to die for our sins. But if you think about it from our perspective, so you create me and I'm born into sin. I'm born with all these challenges, these moral challenges. You create me that way. And then you tell me, right, you've got to get to heaven. And if you don't, well, if you don't, let's say, accept Jesus or whatever it is that you need to do, then you're going to burn in hell forever. This whole focus is on getting to heaven. But actually, you think about it. It's such a depressing, uh, burdensome, almost toxic, even I would say abusive message. I create you against your will. You're born in sin against your will. And then I tell you, go and run to heaven. And if you don't, well, you're going to suffer. And I should be grateful that I'm going to get this salvation. In some ways, you can see how the burden became too much to bear, where they were just like, okay, well, at least we have um, Jesus to help, help us get there. But life actually ends up becoming very burdensome, but also pretty meaningless. It's all just about me who is needy, vulnerable, and in trouble. And okay, I'm going to be saved and get to heaven, so what am I doing here then? What's the point of this whole place? What's the point of this world? What matters here? Can you see it's 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 a and no wonder that it, it ends up turning people off because people feel almost what's the point? You give me all these burdens, all this trouble. Why do I need to go through all this? Why do I need to? And the truth is, you don't need to, if that's the case, because you didn't need to be here in the first place. We didn't need to be born. So now I so don't tell me I need to get anywhere to get to heaven to do anything. Rabbi Manus Friedman was once asked to speak to a boy that was suicidal, deeply suicidal. And he was put in a into a mental institution for a few days so they could monitor him. And he went to see this young boy, 14-year-old boy, just very casually reading his magazine. And he said, uh, your mother's worried about you. Um do you have, you know, how are you doing? Tries to make conversation. He doesn't, doesn't say anything. After a while, the boy said to him, you can leave, Rabbi. There's already been a Christian priest that came to see me. So the rabbi said, oh yeah? What did he say? And he, the, the boy was being very um, flippant and rude to the rabbi. And he said, well, he told me that God loves me. And Rabbi Friedman said, oh, yeah? And what do you think about that? He said, I think that's stupid. And Rabbi Friedman says, yeah, I agree. And the boy put his magazine down. He looked up at him. He said, really? You agree? And uh, Rabbi Friedman says, yeah, I do agree. He said, I don't think God loves you. I think he probably thinks you're an obnoxious brat. <laughs> And the boy said, yeah, I'm listening. He said, but clearly he needs you. You might not like you right now. You're not really taking the life he gave you with much uh, seriousness and sanctity and care. But he must need you else he wouldn't have put you here. And he suddenly listened. He was suddenly interested. And he said, hmm. So I'm here because I'm necessary to God's plan. Suddenly, it was no longer about him, him needing to get to heaven, life feeling like it's, it's all so burdensome. But actually, I'm here because I'm necessary. I'm needed for his plan. So he said, hmm. And what if I don't want to do what God wants me to do or needs me to do? So I said, well, that's called free will. You have a choice. But either way, he needs you and he will always need you. You're an essential part of his plan, else you wouldn't have been created. See, Judaism has a very different premise. 
You're here not because you're needy, not because you need to get there. You're here on this earth because God needs to come down to earth because he needs you. You're not needy, you're needed. And that's why you're here. So why is Judaism so action focused, so acts focused? Because your actions are what will build a more godly world, a better world, a good world, a more heavenly world in which God can come down to earth and dwell here on earth forever. The idea of Judaism of the, of the, the next world is that earth will become heavenly, not earth will ascend to heaven. Doesn't that make so much more sense? And now serving God can make so much more sense as well. How can I serve a God that doesn't need me? A God that just tells me I'm in trouble and need to, need to get to heaven and I'll be saved. No, no, no. I can only serve God if he actually needs something. If he needs me. So God creates us because of his need, his desire. The commandments are the kind of world that he needs. And it's so much better way of viewing things. And so when we talk about you know, Jordan Peterson was grappling with, like, uh, uh, on the one hand, yes, we are saved by Jesus. But on the other hand, we need to act morally. Uh, which one is it? Is it one one or the other? Ju the Jewish view is actually, you know, we do have this thing called Yom Kippur once a year where you are cleansed of your sins. But it's not in order for us to get salvation. It's so that God, it's, it's an intimate day with God where we look at what we've done over the last year. It's like a married couple looking at their last year, forgiving for their mistakes and errors they've done, and then they wipe the slate keen and move forward. Not so they can now have salvation, but so they can continue to move forward and build that relationship, build the godly world here on earth. Which is why, what do we do straight away after that? We go into a sukkah. We build a sukkah, which represents God dwelling here on earth with us. So it's action-based because it's about his need, not ours. You know, Rabbi Friedman actually once saw a, um, a Christian priest who said, do you believe in the Savior? And he said, actually, you know, I'm, I'm not so interested in the God that's, that's going to save me or serve me. I'm looking to serve him. The Christian actually started crying. He said, I'd never thought about that before. And it makes so much more sense. See, I think what might have happened with the birth of Christianity or its developments was they saw the, the commandments, the mitzvot, as what we need to do to get there. Misunderstanding that it's actually about there, the things that we should do so that he can come here. And so if it's all about our burden, our need, and our need to get to heaven, then of course you're going to want to do things to alleviate it. Like say, you're clean, of, cleansed of all your sins if you believe. It may sound nice, but actually life becomes pretty meaningless and dull. What's the point of me being here? And it's burdensome and it's... We don't actually like to be us-centric. We like to serve. We like to be needed and feel necessary. It's the most important thing we actually need. Tell me why I'm here. If people feel like life is meaningless, even if life is going great, if you feel like it's not needed, all the love, respect, materialism in the world cannot compensate for that, which is a real compliment to the human being. And by the way, this point that um, uh, Dave Rubin makes about, you know, well, atheists can be very act-centric, act-focused. Um, of course, you can do good without b believing. But the point is, what actually is good? How do I know what honoring my parents looks like? How do I know what not judging my fellow looks like? How do I know when I can speak of someone behind their backs and when actually I need to, to protect someone? How do I know how much charity to give? How do I know how to do all kinds of things how do i know when to make all kinds of moral choices it's it, everyone uh, the problem is that morality that is entirely atheist in nature becomes opinion based you need an absolute authority and we know in a heart of hearts that there are certain absolute authorities moral authorities but that you can only get that with a god this is not talking about whether um you become a better or worse person that's guaranteed based on your beliefs, but it is saying that it's an essential part of uh, ensuring that God's morality is achieved. We also saw Ben talking about how it's, Judaism is action-based but not faith-based. Well, faith is a 
critical component, or rather I would say faithfulness, because faith often implies without evidence. We certainly think there's plenty of evidence for God, for the God of Israel. But the point is that they, ha they have to work in tandem. We do our action. I think they're in some ways two sides of the same coin. We have to do the actions to bring God down to earth. But why are we doing it? Because in our hearts, in our minds, we want to have this build this relationship with God to serve him. It's like in a relationship. Does my intention matter? My feeling in my heart, my desire to want to grow closer emotionally with my spouse. Does that matter or not in comparison to the a actual actions that I do? Of course, both are important. So just wanted to do this video to um, provide some clarity. We've been doing a lot of current affairs content and we'll continue to do that. But I also want to delve also more into some of the great ideas of Judaism uh, as well. I often pick up on Judaism, even in our current affairs um, videos, to shed light on what Judaism would say about morality and war and all the rest of it. But I think it's also really important that we talk about these big theological questions because the most important question we can ask in life is why are we here? What's the purpose of my existence? Everything else is secondary to that. So if you've got questions around that or videos you think that you give me to respond to, to do with these kind of questions on religion, on Judaism and others, please do let me know. Please comment in the video description. And as always, like, subscribe, and if you're able to, even become a private member. Thanks a lot and see you next time. Hi, thank you so much for watching. To watch another one, click here. To stay up to date with all our content, click here to subscribe. And if you're able to, you can help support JTV to grow and grow by clicking join below this video, where you can become a member and get perks, including early access to videos and private live discussions with me. But most of all, you'll be partnering with us on our mission to change the world.